Okay, so it is September 13th. Um, I'm talking to uh, Ms. Regina Mason. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, we're, my name is Paul Ortiz. We're here with the National Park Service, Underground Railroad Project. And I wonder if we could start by, um, well, first of all, let me ask you, how, I sh how should I refer to you um, in the course of the interview? Do you go by Ms. Mason? Oh, Regina, Regina is okay, fine. Okay, cool. And you can just call me Paul. Um, okay. So, Regina, just to kind of get started, um, can you tell me about, a little bit about how you first found out you had a connection to this incredible ancestor, something about the ancestor and a bit of your early family life? Sure. Uh, I'll start by telling you how I got interested in the family story. I had a fifth, as a, an assignment in the fifth grade at St. Augustine School in Oakland, and it had to do with origins and ancestry. And so I went home to my mom that night and I asked her, um, where are we from? And she started giving me little bits and pieces about the family. I knew that we had roots in the state of Washington and the state of Oregon and of course California. But she started to tell me about um, roots in New England. I had not heard of that before. And uh, then she said something that was really interesting. She said, now my grandpa Fuller was a former slave. And that really just floored me. I said, a slave? And she goes, well, yes, he, he was a slave um, as a child. And I had never heard slavery mentioned in my family at all. I knew slavery was a thing and it had existed. And keep in mind, this is 1971. Um, lots going on in the Bay Area and civil rights. And, um, you know, black nationalist movement and so forth. All this was unfolded in my um, neighborhood. And I knew there was this rage going on, um, but I didn't understand why. But it seemed to me that a lot of it was the residual effects of slavery. So I um, wanted to know more information about this Grandpa Fuller who had married into our family, who was my mother's grandfather. And um, she proceeded to tell me that he was a mulatto and a product of um, a taboo. She didn't use those words, but uh, the plantation owner and uh, an enslaved woman. And it just put slavery on a whole nother level for me. First of all, it personalized it. And I was mad. I was angry because um, it was, slavery was not in the abstract anymore. It wasn't those people over there from long ago. It affected my family and I took it personally. And I, um, went on to really listen to what she was saying. But again, my mother, the youngest of five, and um, she didn't know a whole lot about the family story other than places and names. But she said, you know, you gotta talk to your Aunt Catherine. She's the family historian. And Aunt Catherine is um, actually a cousin, my mother's first cousin. But because she was so much older than us, and in our family, if you are a senior and so forth, we would call you auntie or uncle. And so Auntie Catherine, who, you know, I lovingly called Auntie Catherine as if she were really my aunt. Um, she told me some things that stayed with me forever. Now, the information she gave me didn't come in time for the class assignment. 
So I stood in front of my class and said some very vague details that I really wasn't happy about. And I remember sitting down fast, really happy that this class assignment was over. And I will also say that I went to a predominantly white school. So I think there were just three African Americans in my class. And um, none of us really were able to say much about our family's history. While other kids were talking about the Mayflower, they were talking about ties to George Washington and so on and so forth. And it was quite interesting. And so I felt empty inside. So after the class assignment, my mother, um, took me to see Auntie Catherine, and I remember Aunt Catherine embracing me and saying, oh, you do have a proud history. And she went on to tell me about um, many things, uh, especially our connection to California and um, our connection to uh, New England. And, but one thing that she said stayed with me forever. She said, well, you know, we had, um, one of our ancestors had a connection to the Underground Railroad. That floored me. And what's his name? I wanted to know because I'm a kid just learning about the Underground Railroad in um, school. And I knew it represented a form of resistance. So I said, tell me more. And she said, well, I think he's from New Haven, Connecticut. And um, I know his last name was Grimes. That was all to this story. And it was the one that resonated with me. And I said, you, you, isn't there more information? She said, well, I'm sorry, that's all I know. And I, every time I saw Auntie Catherine, I would ask her, now tell me about this Grimes person, but she, what she gave me was essentially three little clues. And those clues were the Grimes surname, New Haven, and the Underground Railroad. So let's fast forward 20 some years. I had those, that same desire to f figure out or want more information about this Grimes character. So I began taking up genealogy. And by this time, I'm a young wife and I have two little daughters, a toddler and a preschooler. And I thought, you know, I wanna be able to give them their history. I don't ever want them to stand in front of their class not feeling good about themselves and their, their family story. And so I took up, I began genealogy and I, I started finding records. And I know this is a long winded approach to great. answering your great. question, but I want your audience to understand the depths of this, this search. And so um, I would find, I started with the federal censuses and I started with my, um, I started with the 1900s because I knew that our family was in California by 1900. And um, I did find the 1900 uh, federal census for San Francisco, because that's where they lived. And I saw my grandmother as a little girl with all of her brothers and sisters there, her mother and father, and her mother was Mary um, Angeline Williams, who married Henry Fuller. Okay, and so I found under the Fuller, in the Fuller household, this incredible document that showed my family. And I was bitten by the bug. I felt like if I can find documents, surely there's gotta be something, or at least I hope, written about a Grimes character who was connected to the Underground Railroad. And so um, I began reading everything I could find on the Underground Railroad, on the abolitionist movement. I didn't know what capacity this ancestor um, 
was associated with the Underground Railroad, if that makes sense. So in my heart, I wanted to believe he was like Frederick Douglass, which was the only African-American abolitionist that I knew at the time. I was in grade school and even forward. And so, um, you know, I began my search with a whole bunch of possibility. But after months and months of uh, dead ends, the reality of how big my task was began to set in. And I was about to just give up and just say, well, you know, uh, I'll probably not find him, but I'll still do my genealogy research. But one day I had all these library books to return. And I noticed a title that I hadn't read. And it was Charles L. Bloxon, The Underground Railroad. And I said, well, let me look at this before I turn it in. And I flipped immediately to the free New England section because, of course, I knew William Grimes. Excuse me. I didn't know William Grimes at the time, so that you want to nick. So let me start all over again. So I had all these library books that were due to that were due. And on one title I um, hadn't even bothered to, to read or look at. And it was Charles L. Bloxon's book, The Underground Railroad. So I flipped to the free New England section because I knew my family was from New England. And within the first page, first few pages of that um, section in the book, Bloxon wrote about a man named William Grimes, who escaped slavery from Savannah, Georgia, and that he had been hid beneath or among cotton bales on a brig that was going to bring him to New York. And on foot, once he got to New York, on foot he was directed by people associated with the Underground Railroad who directed him to New Haven, Connecticut. In that instant, three things were solidified that Aunt Catherine had told me. The Grimes surname, the city of New Haven, Connecticut, and the fact that I was reading about the Underground Railroad. So immediately I thought, is this the person? Is this the Grimes Auntie Catherine was talking about? And I wanted to know, where did Bloxon get his information? Well, there were no footnotes, but there was a bibliography. And in there was the bibliography. I, excuse me, in there was the book. Life of William Grimes, The Runaway Slave. I almost fell out my chair. I thought, my God, there is a book. That, that, I, but I didn't know if this guy belonged to me or not. So immediately I knew, I, you know, something deep down told me he did, but I had a lot more research to do. The first thing was to get that narrative, to read it to see were there any clues, any other names, anything else that would corroborate the stories that Aunt Catherine told. So um, that was my introduction to William Grimes. Um, that was my introduction to, or that's how I was led on a path to William Grimes based upon that story, which was really just a sentence of three clues that my aunt gave me. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while, it took me years to, to um, you know, not just make the connection. I would make the connection rather quickly in my research, but it would take me years then to uh, edit his narrative and so forth. So I don't want to get ahead of things. Uh, I definitely want you to ask your, your questions because I can ramble on and <laughs> forever in a day. Well, you've actually answered quite a few of the questions already. So, okay. um, but yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, Regina, as you're, as you're finding this information out, and part of this is a family journey, part of it is you're in school, you have assignment, and then you begin doing your own research. And this is obviously unfolding over a long period of time. Yes. 
but can you take us back to how this, because um, you mentioned your aunt Catherine as being a really important part of your life. And when you began doing this and learning more so that you could kind of like, maybe did you go back to her and say, well, you know, Aunt Catherine, I, I, I'm finding out this amazing information. Right. So I guess I'm kind of curious about how this began, to, did this begin to affect your family? And Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, where do I even begin? Uh, the first thing for me was to, to read William Grimes' story, and I'm looking for clues. But, you know, I couldn't even get beyond the first few pages because it was so depressing, so brutal, so graphic. It, nothing I'd ever read about slavery prepared me for this man's text. So I did get through it. It wasn't until the end, towards the end of the book, that he mentions his wife as being the lovely and all accomplished Clarissa Caesar. So that was the only thing I had to go back to Auntie Catherine and ask her if Caesar was a family name. And she said, I think so, but I'm not sure. Then she said something that just blew my mind. She said, I've got to get you the family Bible. All the family names are written in it. <laughs> A Bible? Why didn't you tell me about this before? Who has it? Where is it? I was, she said, well, I think it's tucked away in my sister's attic. I'll go up to Portland, Oregon to see if it's there. And I said, well, when are you going? She goes, well, you know, not until the weather gets better. And so, so Auntie Catherine was operating on her time, but I, I, I was on a mission. I, I needed to know. So I started asking other people in her age bracket about the Bible. And so I even asked my mother, who was born in 1933. She's the youngest of a, her siblings, and then she had the older cousins. She said, you know, I've always heard about this Bible, but I've never seen it. I don't think there is one, really. She says, and if there is one, I, it's probably the, gone, it's lost. And so I talked to other family members who were even older than Aunt Catherine at the time, and they said, well, I haven't seen a Bible, so I thought it was fictional. I didn't, be, I started to not believe that there was this Bible. And um, so I said, okay, I don't have the Bible. Let me, what else can I do? So I said, let me look for William Grimes, the author, and see whether or not I can find his family and see whether those names corroborate or are um, or some of the names that I had found looking for family previously, or if that makes sense. So I thought maybe I could find a connection that way. So as I began to share this narrative with family members, Aunt Catherine in particular, and my mother and so forth, they didn't necessarily know or feel that there was a connection, but that name Caesar, which was the only clue in that book, really stuck with Aunt Catherine and she's thinking, you know, I think that is a family name. But what I didn't know that as I was doing my research, because I would find William Grimes, the author, in um, the federal censuses, um, I followed his family, but none of the names cross-reference with the names that I began to accumulate. And so what was happening was I was going back in the research, I was going back too far too fast. I mean, there's a method to the process of genealogy, but I was leaping over generations and that's what you don't want to do. So anyway, so I wasn't finding the success there. But one day I get a call from my mother and she says, well, you know, Aunt Catherine's on her way home and she found the family Bible. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> this was Memorial Day weekend of 1993. And I, um, I, I said, 
my goodness, I couldn't wait. When Catherine didn't like to fly, she's on the train, it's gonna take her a lot longer than I, I needed to wait, right? But when she did come home and we all had, uh, it was Memorial Day weekend actually that we all got together in anticipation of the Bible pages and I was the first to study them. But what got me was the fact that, and I get emotional about it now, that on these pages that were so frail, so blotted and stained, was this rich history that spoke to another time and place, but yet it connected to me. It was so moving that all I could do was cry. Because I went back to that fifth grade experience and not being empowered with my family history, not feeling good about it, not wanting to talk about slavery, not wanting to, to talk about a history of en enslavement. But at that point, I couldn't talk about how we came out of it and how we empowered ourselves and how we were able to have this sense of pride and so forth based on um, our history. I didn't have that. So in that moment, I'm studying these pages and I come down to the name William Grimes with a death date of, excuse me, of August 25th, 1865. Well, I knew researching William Grimes, the author, that that was the day that he died. There were newspapers that I had come upon and I knew without a doubt that he was my great, great, great grandfather. So that's how I was able to solidify it as a family. Um, it just brought us together in ways that were so beautiful because even today, generation, the generation after me, my children's, and then I've got, a, there's another generation that's just coming up. Um, after them and cousins across the family tree lines have viewed me as the historian of the family. So Aunt Catherine, who was the historian, had, had unwittingly passed the torch to me. So I not only get calls from the younger generations, but I'm getting calls from, from people that um, have found that my body of work that want to know more about the story because I was able to connect us to our European ancestry as well. So. It, 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 was, it has been a very interesting um, journey, so. Yeah. Regina, you were mentioning when you first, if you could take us back to the first time you opened William Grimes's book, his narrative, and you said um, it was very painful to read it. You had never seen anything like that. Right. Can you tell us like how, what, what were your feelings when you started reading this? And what are, what are your memories of that? Um, okay. I think I, there's got to be a little backstory to this. I had a Catholic school education. Uh, we did not, I, I never saw African American teachers. We never studied or had Black History Month or week or any of that. So what I got about African-American history was basically what was told to me from my family or I would, or the books that were on my, our shelves in our den. 
I remember we had an original of Lerone Bennett's Before the Mayflower, and I'm in fifth grade after this assignment looking for anything to make me understand our history. And um, even that compilation didn't speak to me about the brutality of slavery as it was told through the lens of William Grimes. So it was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. And especially to put it on a whole nother level to know that this is my ancestor, not someone else's story, but this story was my story. It uh, was heartbreaking. William Grimes was born um, in 1784, around 1784, on the heels of the American Revolution. And he opens his book with biting sarcasm. He says, I was born in a land of liberty. And I, 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 I'm paraphrasing. He says something like, I was born in the land of equality, liberty and equality, yet I was born a slave. So right then and there in that moment, he is letting you know the ambiguity in, of American liberty. And it was striking. He said, how are you boasting and being so prideful of your independence, but yet you have me enslaved? It was powerful. It was powerful. And so, um, but then he goes into his life. He talks about slavery on a level that you're not going to find in history books. He said, my father, and he leaves a blank, he doesn't name him, was a wealthy white planter. And my mother, he doesn't name her was enslaved. And he goes on to talk about how he, even though he knew who his father was, he was owned by a Dr. Stewart on a neighboring plantation. Very shocking to me, because you don't get that in history books. They're not going to tell you those fine details. He said, that he was born a bastard because he was of this mixed race union that could never be together anyway as, I don't know whether he wanted to say as man and wife because he doesn't really talk about the details of his birth. Um, we don't know, was his mother raped? Uh, was there any sort of mutual affection? None of that can ever come out. None of it is told. But he goes on to say that in the slave states, the children follow the condition of the mother. And so he was therefore owned by Dr. Stewart, just as his mother was owned by Dr. Stewart. And he talks about seeing his father from time to time at Dr. Stewart's plantation. So, um, you know, we whitewash slavery. Um, But here you have this first person narrative that tells you the details that you aren't going to ever hear. And so um, William Grimes also goes on to tell about the brutality that he endured. He was 10 years old when he was sold away from Dr. Stewart to um, a 
Colonel Thornton, who lived on a far off plantation in, um, I think Culpeper County at the time. And those boundaries have changed over the years. But anyway, he talks about Colonel Thornton being very severe and he's on this plantation where he knows no one. He's 10. He tells us about sabotage among other slaves because I come to realize that they are looking out for themselves. It wasn't the story that Alex Haley told in Roots in terms of, if you can ever remember or know the story, um, Fiddler, the uh, violinist, embraced Kunta, the new enslaved young um, enslaved person on this particular plantation and was taken under the wing of Fiddler who was um, looking out for him, but William Grimes didn't have that. And I noticed when I read Douglas's narrative too, Frederick Douglass didn't have that either. And he also talked about the sabotage that was taking place. So it was interesting to me to get those two perspectives because it allows me to understand what, where the truth lies. And so, um, William Grimes talked about this uh, woman who was enslaved working in the house and that William Grimes was entrusted to uh, make the coffee and he also had the keys to, I guess, where all the provisions were kept. He's 10 at the time. So Patty, who is the enslaved woman, um, sabotages things. She puts medicine in the coffee and William Grimes, as a 10 year old boy, is accused of it. And he receives the worst beating that I could not even imagine anyone surviving. But he was, uh, beat with a lash, I think a whip, 49 times. Um, and he said it just, it took the, it just took the life out of him and so forth. And that was the beginning of the stripes on his back. And uh, so again, I'm reading this and I'm hearing about the brutality, seeing the brutality in graphic ways. And one thing I, I've came to learn through Dr. Bill Andrews, he's a scholar that um, I started sharing my information with because I knew that he was an expert on the slave narratives because I needed someone to help me make sense of the Grimes narrative. And he was really surprised that I was doing this research. So we would communicate back and forth. And he and I eventually partnered to create a new edition of the Grimes narrative. But I learned through him how um, William Grimes' narrative is not an easy fit in the genre of slave narratives um, because it predates the abolitionist movement. So there was really no model for William Grimes to look at as he's writing his book. So he's, he's not writing for a white audience. That's what I really want to say. He's just telling you like it is. So his narrative probably is the most graphic slave narrative that you will ever pick up. The others were, um, they had a network of abolitionist white men that were able to sanitize these narratives in a way. And then also we know, and I, I listen, I'm definitely not comparing William Grimes to Frederick Douglass, who was just a genius and exceptional and so forth. But, um, it goes to show you that the different voices are from these narratives are so 
powerful because you get different perspectives. But William Grimes' narrative was not picked up by the abolitionist movement because it predates. So he didn't have that network, that circle of white men to um, sort of protect him or even to advise him on even how to write. Yeah. So. Well, it's fascinating too, Regina, because yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking because I went back over the edition of William Grimes' book that you worked on. And I thought, you know, earlier this summer I gave a lecture on the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. And so what you're saying really resonates with me because you're right, I mean, Douglass had a whole network, you know, he had Wendell Garrison and Wendell Phillips, but he felt constricted by that. And we know this because the second autobiography of Douglass is very different than the first, right? Yeah. And then the third is even more different. And the first is Douglass speaking clearly to white people. I, th I think, but Grimes is, is, you know, I'm going to tell you what slavery is really like, right? Is that your sense? That's my take on it as well. It is. And one other thing I, I wanted to say that Dr. Andrews pointed out to me, that William, uh, that Frederick Douglass never really had to work a day in his life in terms of trying to carve out a living for himself because he immediately went on a speaking circuit, mm -hmm. which was f fabulous. And, and there are other slave narratives that have that, um, that connection to that white network as well. Uh, William Grimes, um, had to carve out a life. He was always fighting tooth and nail for survival before his narrative and after his narrative. And so if I didn't have this um, context from uh, uh, Dr. Andrews, and if I hadn't read other slave narratives, I would not have known this. And so the average reader is not going to know this, which is why it's so important to put Grimes' narrative in historical context. Because without it, you may come away f trying to understand who this man really was, because uh, his Bill says his book reads like a list of grievances, and it, it, they, it really does, you know, and I've had to read this narrative at least 50 times. I even had to pull it apart and index it so that I could put it in a chronological order of happenings, because in his book, he doesn't do that. In fact, he says that at the end of his narrative, he says, I may be a little bit mistaken because I could not really keep the dates. And who helped me understand why he couldn't keep the dates was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass clearly in his narrative says that slaves were not privy to dates, days of the weeks. So they associate things with events that happen. So I had to try to put Grimes' narrative on a timeline based upon events that he talks about. And that was the only way that I could really put his narrative in order. And then studying the white people who kept the dates, who wrote down everything, studying their movements as well. And putting it all together helped me and Bill create the, the 2008 edition of the Grimes narrative. And even now, there's so much more that I know about this narrative and William Grimes that um, I've been fortunate enough to get a fellowship at uh, Yale that I will go to next, in the spring of 2024 and dig more deeply in the, the narrative about uh, Grimes and his connections to literacy and the men of, of 
Yale and so forth. So there's a whole nother aspect or dynamic to William Grimes that doesn't even come out in the 2008 edition that I'm looking forward to um, uh, picking up. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah. So Regina, now of course we've seen your, um, the book talks that you've done, uh, the, the C-SPAN book talks, and you know, we were talking about this process of bringing, of kind of updating William Grimes' narrative for a modern audience. But I wonder if you could take us back to when you're at an earlier point before you do that, you know, before the film, of course, mm -hmm. but maybe sometime in the 80s or 90s, can you take us back to like the first time you began to think about, okay, I want to make this more than a family story. I want to like educate people with this and maybe a little bit of your thought process, like what, what were the elements of William Grimes's story and your family's history that you really wanted to share with the younger audiences? Absolutely. Or? Okay. Once I discovered the Grimes narrative and I knew slave narratives were out there, I had only read two, you know, which was Douglas and uh, Harriet Jacobs. And I knew those were dynamic narratives. They were the um, very popular ones. And I wanted to know, was anybody reading the Grimes narrative? Um, how could this slave narrative be lost to time? And I wanted to bring his voice back because I wanted to, it to read a, a reach a wider audience. And so I was talking to Bill Andrews, Dr. Andrews about that. And he was the one that said, well, the first thing that we should do um, is, you know, create a new edition. So he was the one that broached the idea, um, you know, and I thought it was great, but I was unsure of if I was the one to do this because I didn't have the education behind me. All I, I um, had done a lot of the research, but I couldn't put it in that historical context. Bill Andrews could. And so um, that's, the starting point of me wanting to bring this story to a wider audience. So I delivered on the, the research. He delivered on putting it into historical um, context. And so um, I looked at William Grimes and I realized all this man wanted to do was tell his story because the black voice is often stifled in history, silenced. And I didn't want that for him. I didn't want his narrative just to remain in some archive for maybe someone to look at it. And so I started telling my story because I realized that there is power in genealogy, and especially when you pair it with historical research. And that's what I was doing all along. So in it, I became empowered, and I wanted to, at the same time, empower other people to pursue their histories. Because if I, I don't know that there's anyone else who has recovered a slave narrative from their family and edited it and brought it to life. Um, I, I could be wrong, um, but I think we have to go back and reclaim these stories. I think every written slave narrative needs to be researched thoroughly and edited. 
and I think it need, they need to be connected to family members who may not know. And I, even with the um, oral uh, WPA narratives, enslaved narratives, they're accessible to the public now, and people are finding them and connecting them to their family history. So there's a whole movement out there. And I think um, me telling the story helps people to branch out and discover their own. And I wanted to pay homage to William Grimes. I, I think his story is valuable. I mean, he's not just telling us about plantation slavery. He's telling us about urban slavery. He's not telling you just about, um, you know, what it was like on a plantation. He's going to tell you what mobility was like for the enslaved African Americans in places like Savannah, Georgia where he um, was enslaved under six different masters, but in an urban setting where he had mobility. He talks about the brutality on the uh, Thornton plantation where he actually grew to manhood, but how brutal the overseers were, how awful it was to he was always fighting with uh, slaves, all right? Um, so he tells, gives his perspective on all avenues of enslavement. And it, what was interesting to me was when he finally was able to, instead of wearing uh, uh, rags on the Thornton Plantation, but when he gets to Savannah, Georgia, he is a coachman and he is dressed to the nines for someone who's enslaved. And what that did for him in his uh, persona and what he was able to do to blend in, he being this light-skinned mulatto slave mistaken for being white at times and how he infiltrated those circles and what it must have felt to him to be able to fool white people and even maybe what it did for his ego, I don't know, but he gives all those nuances in his enslaved narrative, which is very important and very valuable at the same time as we look at slave enslavement. Regina, as you think about his, um, his uh, the original narrative and then the research that you have been able to do over the years, describe for us William Grimes's escape or his flight to freedom. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yes. William Grimes actually was in his last enslaver was uh, Mr. Wellman. And um, there was some falling out between he and uh, Mr. Wellman. And he was actually put in jail, not in jail for robbing or stealing or um, beating any, just in jail for being defiant, okay? And the, in an urban setting, uh, you know, you didn't have the overseer, but you had the jails, and that's where they would put you. And um, he, I think, resolved that if he got the opportunity, he would take it. So he got out of jail and um, he was still owned by a doctor, excuse me, by um, Mr. Wellman. And he 
Mr. Wellman was going to Bermuda with his family, but he was leaving William Grimes behind to take care of the estate and the grounds and so forth. And um, William Grimes was then told that he had to go out and find work, which is to hire your time. So he goes down to the harbor in Savannah to find work, and he does. And he was um, lifting bales of cotton on this brig called the Casket, and he was in line with other workers. And also there were black sailors on this ship. And uh, they kind of gave him the idea to stow away. And so he decided that he was going to do it. And so on this brig, um, among, he hid among cotton bales. And he got to quarantine ground, which was Stanton Island. And you, to go through quarantine, you have to be observed by a doctor. So he didn't know how he was going to do that. Let me backtrack. I'm sorry. Let's cut that whole thing. Because I'm not telling it correctly in sequence. So William Grimes was hiring out his, t no, let me stop. OK. William Grimes had been jailed by Dr. Wellman not for stealing, not for um, hurting anyone, but just for being defiant. And he spent a number of days there, and then Dr. Wellman got him out, and he decided that he was going to take a trip to Bermuda. That's where his family was. And he was left behind um, to hire his time. And so William Grimes went down to the harbor in Savannah, and he got in line to find work on this ship. And the ship was um, loading up bales of cotton on a brig called the Casket. And there were sailors, African-American sailors, that befriended him and gave him the idea to escape. And so they left a spot for him to stow away, and he did. And at night, he would come out and get some fresh air because he said there were a number of people on the ship that, or the brig, that looked like him. So he, and it being dark, he uh, didn't feel like he would be a threat or found out. But he was found out. They recognized him. The captain recognized him and said, Theodore, that was his enslaved name at the time, how did you get on here? OK? And so I didn't really fully ex explain his name. Um, but you know, when you're on anybody's plantation, they'll give you any slave name they wanted to. So he maybe there was another William. So at this point, he was Theodore. And so the, they recognized that the first thing they needed to do was get him off of that brig. And so the sailors said, work with me, and we'll get you off of here. But you had to go through quarantine. He said he almost fainted because he didn't know how he was going to explain himself. But it just so happens that he was able to, to get by to maneuver by without being noticed, and they got on a packing ship with these sailors. And from Staten Island, they took him to New York City. And uh, he was put up and so forth. Then um, he was able to get some provisions. He uh, met a, per a woman on the grounds, on the, the street in um, uh, New York City, and he wanted to get some things to take with him t to have. And so she, they're walking, and um, he is noticed 
by one of his former master's relatives. And at the time, I think his name was John, and they said, John, why, why are you here? How did you get here? And um, he had a big lie ready for him. And uh, I don't know. I'm sorry, guys, I'm rambling on, and I don't know if any of that's useful, but <laughs> what should I say next? So then he um, is directed on foot to, to New, New Haven. And how did he select New Haven? I have no idea. But I do know in the narrative, when he is with one of the Thornton brothers, um, someone visits and they're speaking about New Haven. And William Grimes says, I never thought I would see it. So maybe in his mind, he wanted to always go to New Haven, but for whatever reason, he was directed on foot to New Haven. So can we leave that at, at that? Yeah, because the stories, you know, you mentioned, and I think there's some reasons that when I went back over, and, and I confess I didn't reread the entire narrative, because the first time I looked at the narrative was under the direction of Raymond Gavins when I was a grad student at Duke. Okay. And uh, with John Hope Franklin, you know, as, oh, as yeah. kind of a convener. Yeah, absolutely. And so I couldn't recall that the, the level of detail, but I do remember that Dr. Franklin would tell us over and over again, look, when you read the narratives, the first thing you have to understand is that you mentioned earlier audience. And so he's, uh, Dr. Franklin would say, the first thing you have to understand is that the authors of the narratives, no matter when they were written, even if they were written after slavery, would keep details very close to their hearts because people could be severely punished and were punished. And even long after the end of slavery times, if it was discovered that you had been a part of someone's odyssey to freedom, people were very upset about that, you know, white people especially. And so there were repercussions. And so he said it's always been a challenge to try to figure out, well, how did a person find their pathway to freedom? And and the other thing he mentioned, the last thing I remember is he said, it's never, what was the phrase he used? It's never a straight pathway. Uh, it's always convoluted. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, so that, that's, yeah. that's, really powerful and that is true and I mentioned earlier that William Grime left a lot of blanks in his book he didn't name these people he's writing during slavery times and he's protecting people his mother his father and even as he's writing about all these other uh, different plantation owners and so forth so I found it very interesting what I didn't say that um, another part of me making the connection to from William Grimes to his father was that in the Grimes narrative, he talks about a murder that takes place on his father's plantation. And he said he murdered, shot and killed a man by the name of Mr. Galava. And I thought, well, if I can find out who, if, if there is any written record of this murder, then that would connect or should connect me to his father. So I went down the rabbit hole of researching old newspapers. And I mean, it would have taken years to sort through this. It wasn't the digital age. You know, I mean, it just wasn't, but they had a compiled record of old newspapers and it, uh, it was all alphabetized. And I was able to look up the Grimes names and it was a G-R-Y-M-E-S spelling, old English spelling, I guess. And I went through all of those names and found a salutation that corroborated the story that William Grimes is told and it said something like um benjamin oh no robert galloway so it wasn't galloway galava but galloway was shot and killed by benjamin grimes of eaglesness and it was told what newspaper 
gave the newspaper citation like the um, the Virginia Gazette, I believe it was in several or a couple newspapers. And um, I was able to get with the Virginia Historical Society and gather those newspapers that talked about the murder that took place at Eagle's Nest. So William Grimes didn't mention Eagle's Nest in his book, but again, he's writing and keeping things close to him, just as you said, because there could be repercussions. But the fact that I was able to find it based on the murder and the newspapers and transcripts, that um, it just took the Grimes narrative to another level because then I was able to reveal who the players were, who the genealogy connected to on the, uh, and the history of Eagle's Nest itself, who, uh, whose progen progenitor was a William Fitzhugh, who was one of the most wealthy men in Virginia in the um, 18th century. And so here this narrative is coming to life based on doing the research, which is why I think it's so important to research, thoroughly research these slave narratives. You've done incredible research. It's meticulous. It is, oh, thank you. you know, it's in a spirit of, of love and it's just so incredibly educational. And I want to talk a little bit later about um, kind of the K through 12 dimension of it because I think it's really critical. But one of the things that strikes me, Regina, about when I hear you talking about William Grimes' narrative, the thing that strikes me too is how early on he talks about this crime that takes place. Now, and there's, it'll, you mentioned Harriet Jacobs, um, that, and I also think of Garnett and other people who talk about this kind of shadowy world. They refer to it sardonically was the term you used earlier about one Grimes. They refer to it as like the chivalry. But when you go behind that wall of the chivalry, um, it's a really violent, um, just kind of chaotic, almost apocalyptic kind of world. <laughs> but the thing that strikes me about Grimes and, and, and in Douglas's narrative, not just not to keep on going back to that, but Douglas's narrative, it, that's there but it's always more in the background until he confronts, you know, William Covey, the yeah. slave breaker, right? Yeah. But, William, but Grimes starts right away. He wants you to know this is the kind of world. This is how white people even interact with each other. I mean, it's violence. It is. It is a violence that is unfathomable. I mean, there was a point in that I'm reading this narrative, I'm thinking, do I want to claim any of this? It is beyond the scope of my understanding. I can't imagine humanity like this. I can't imagine people treating each other this way. Yeah. It's a culture. It's just not isolated incidences. It is a culture of violence that I would not want to impose upon anyone. Yeah. It reminds me of, you know, thinking about William Grimes and his connection to, you know, James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Baldwin was talking about the fire next time. Mm -hmm. He says, he's writing to his nephew and he says, look, the Negro problem is, is not about you. It's about the, the problems that white people can't get along with each other. And so they take their anger out on us. And that's what you need to know about growing up as a young black man in this country. Wow, that's powerful. But that's great. And, that, and Baldwin gets that from his elders, what he reflects upon how they talk about their relationship to each other, but also to white people. And then, kind of, you know, I also think about, see, there's a literary quality, I think, that you have, uh, you've kind of excavated for us 
about the Grimes story, it's very, very much like reading Toni Morrison's Beloved, uh -huh. you know, the early part of it, where it's a very, it's a revolution. She wrote a, re a revolutionary novel about slavery that um, almost harkens also back to like William Faulkner, uh, mm -hmm. Absalom, Absalom, where there's that brutality that people have to survive and somehow claim their own dignity. Um, that is really incredible. <laughs> what is um, particularly hurting to me about the Grimes um, narrative comes toward the end when he says that he was a fast learner, and if only he was given a chance, he would have gone on, alluding that he would have gone on to do great things in his life. He, um, so that, that's the essence of enslavement, denying people the right to live. And I think of all the enslaved people who went to their death and never once did we know their name or their story, which is why what I do, I feel is so important to me. Um, if we deny people their humanity, then we deny them the right to live. And William Grimes is an example of this. He fought enslavement, the slave system, at every turn in every way fathomable. If he was feigning illness because he did not want to do what the master said to do, and that looks, that is a form of rebellion, yes, but it's also a form of denying the enslavement, the reality of the situation. It's saying, in fact, in his narrative, he, he even says, that, and this is a quote, I had too much sense and feeling to be a slave. But you know, there's also, William Rogers was, was so complex. I mean, he's also dealing with issues of his light skin, of being this, person who's enslaved, but yet he can look at his white master and, 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 and have to deal with being enslaved, but looking like the white family. I mean, it gets so complicated, so complicated. And, um, but then again, in his narrative, he tells us who he is, how he self-identified. Because everybody, especially in this country of America, we're put into boxes so where we can't self-identify. We're always told, no, you check off that box. You're this, you're that. But William Grimes tells you in the opening of his preface of his book, he says that he is three parts white but passes as a Negro. So he's talking about being only a one quarter of African American, but he says he passes as a Negro, that he's married to a black woman. And if, and, and during that time, if you're saying you're black, that meant she's dark skinned. There's no obvious or ambiguity about who or 
what she is. So to me, that tells me where his heart was. I mean, because I've seen scholars write about William Grimes being conflicted, you know, this, this white looking man caught up in, uh, you know, being enslaved and so forth. But he had the opportunity to tell you how he self-identified in his narrative. I thought that was so powerful. Yeah. He doesn't seem conflicted in the narrative. No, he's not. Yeah, I think we're conflicted, maybe. Absolutely. Um, but he also uses his light skin to his advantage. You know, someone had a question somewhere, and they, they wanted to say, do you think he was a tragic mulatto? And I, I just know America is the tragedy. Those white men who stood around and decided you were this, you're that, that, they're the tragedy, you know? And then putting you in this box to keep a race pure, that's laughable, and to keep control and keep the hierarchy at a certain level. That's what this is all about. So. Um, William Grimes, and again, this is in Savannah. He's working as a coachman, which means he's dressed appropriately because if you're going to be out in public representing a white family, you're not going to be dressed in rags. You're not going to be dressed like you're off of a plantation. You're going to be dressed because, because you represent the level of that, uh, you represent the level of society that you want it, you want represented. So that coachman has to look like he is someone of means, but yet he's a servant. Don't get me wrong, he's still a servant, but he's not a plantation slave. So it amazes me the network that these enslaved people had though with each other. There was uh, an enslaved person who worked on the Thornton plantation that got word of mouth that William Grimes was in Savannah. So this, um, he's a free man. I can't remember his name in the, in the narrative, but he comes to visit William Grimes because he's on business in Savannah with, um, he's a servant for some white man, okay? And so he looks William Grimes up. There's this network through the grapevine where they find each other. All right. And it gets to be after hours. And the gentleman, and I can't remember his name in the book, has to go back because he's got to go to work in the morning. And William Grimes says, well, you're not going to get beyond the Savannah watch. And the watch was white men who were overlooking the streets, making sure that black people were in their place. OK. And so. William Grimes says, look, I will take you. Follow me. He puts on his finery, his, his clothes that white people would wear in society. And he is sure that he's not going to be approached. And he wasn't. And he was able to su successfully um, escort this enslaved, not enslaved, but he's a free man of color, but this servant to wherever he needed to go. And so I thought that was really interesting that how he moved in the world among white people. And that wasn't the first incident in his book where he passes for white. But it had to be empowering to him as well. So I it just, these are elements of enslavement that you just don't get in history, as, I, as we talked about earlier. Exactly. Well, I, I have so many questions, Virginia, but I also wanted, I know Donovan and Robert and Armin probably have questions too. Um, Donovan, do you want to? Sure. Oh, yeah. 
This is uh, Donovan Carter here. So thank you so much again, Ms. Regina, for um, having us today. This has been incredible. I'm thank riding you. like crazy over here. Um, so I want to ask about um, how do you think William became literate? Do you ah, have an idea question. of how that? He doesn't tell us exactly. Uh, he's not r even writing his book for that reason. He, again, he's writing his book because he wants you to know the outrage. He wants you to know what he's mm -hmm. been through. But he leaves several clues in his book. So um, one clue was um, Colonel Thornton puts a, a, a stove in the uh, slave quarters and the mortar is still green, so you're able to make impressions and so forth. And William Grimes is making letters and symbols and so forth on this. And he gets a severe beating, but he does not tell us exactly why. He doesn't say it was for being literate, or which was a huge thing because it's going to show the slave, enslaved people that he's capable of writing. And that's empowerment. And uh, the other thing was, was the beating for damaging property. They'd have to redo that to get rid of the, the letters and so forth. So no, and this was a, a big clue. This, he's in Savannah at the time. He's working for a Dr. Colick. And uh, Dr. Colick is away from the office. I think he's um, out of town, but William Grimes is left to work worked there and there was a Dr. Sherman that was taking the place of Dr. Colick. And there was a letter that was left for Dr. Sherman that simply said, or note, that simply said, Sherman is a quack. That's very insulting, right? Mm -hmm. But what was interesting to me was that they accused, everybody in that office, or in that work setting, accused William Grimes of writing that note. So that really told me that he was literate. I mean, he wasn't just carving symbols. He could write. And <laughs> that was shocking to me. But he swore up and down that he didn't leave that note. But just the fact that he was accused of it meant that everyone around him knew that he was capable of doing it. And he, he talks about, too, his wife being a big help to him. He, he closes out his narrative with his wife having a tolerable education. And I really would like to mention her, Clarissa Caesar, because a lot of time we lose the women in the story. And um, she was literate. I even have her signature on... Um, it's a copy, photocopy. She, very brilliant lady. She, um, at the time of William Grimes' death, she also lost a son in the Civil War. And she sued for his pension. She got a lawyer to represent her. And um, she had to sign documents. And all that has been preserved at the National Archive in association with her son's military file, pension record, and so mm -hmm. forth. So um, she definitely was a f fighter. Her father was Timothy Caesar, who served in the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. And I have to say his name, too, because I was never taught in school that there were any African-American Revolutionary War patriots. I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I was much older. But imagine teaching that to kids. Imagine telling that story. Wow. <laughs> How empowered children would feel. And see, that was another part of going back to that fifth grade assignment, standing in front of my class, not knowing anything about my family history. 
But feeling the omission of black people other than we were slaves in our history books. And I was right in the middle of all of that. Okay, we, we, I'd like to think we've come a long way since then, but I see the pushback as well. I see people wanting to forget and people not wanting to tell that story. So what story do you want to tell? I believe in telling the truth. <laughs> but a lot of these decision makers and politicians don't want the truth. Not to divide us. The truth won't ever divide us. Mm -hmm. It will set us free. Absolutely. Wow, that's amazing. I, the, uh, the note you say, I think that's very powerful, you know, the fact that it was attributed to him. And I think the, I guess the threat of that being so uh, prevalent in his story is just amazing. Um, I also want to ask, you talked about how, a couple times, how he had different names. Yes. Um, and how different names were assigned to him. He penned his, his narrative under his own name. And I want to ask, well, one, why do you think that is? And two, do you, um, kind of, why do you think he, he, he penned his, you know, narrative under his own name? And also, what do you think that meant for him to do that? Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, African American people have an oral history because we were not given the opportunity to write. It was denied us. This is a man who seized it, who took it and into his own hands on his own terms. Okay, he was told by his mother what his name was, and that was good enough for him. He's not just assuming the name. There's that oral history that you, if you can't prove it, it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. which is so unfair, so unfair. So for him, to know who he was and say his name was empowering in and of itself. But then to put it on the front cover of a book, my God. But not only that, he said, written by himself. Mm -hmm. He was the first of the authors of slave narratives to do that at least of the fugitive slave narratives, because I'm not sure about Equiano, I don't, I, so I, maybe I can't go that far, but I will say, how empowering is that to write your name written by himself? Mm. So it was a bold, if not revolutionary statement for a man of color to make in 1825, and I need to point out, he wrote twice in his life, 1825, 1855. I came across the, across the 1855 narrative first. Um, and it is everything that the 1825 narrative encompasses, but it has an append, a chapter appended to the end where he's writing about his exploits in old age and so forth. And we do know today that that, portion of the narrative was dictated to, mm. and I, the name escapes me who it was dictated to. Um, this is recent scholarship that has come out um, by Dr. Susanna Ashton from Clemson University. She was able to find that. Mm. So at the time, I'm looking for all of these th newspapers where I'm thinking William Grimes, because he, not only that, let me backtrack a little bit, he was hired out to a printer in Savannah, Georgia. Wallhopper, I believe is the name. That may have been his first taste of print culture, being right in the middle of it, okay? Uh, he 
We do know up to that point he was literate, but he knew the power of print. And it may have been ignited in Savannah, Georgia, having worked for the printer, okay? Because I will tell you, and this is what I will be working on at Yale, there's several newspapers that I have finally put my hands on. In the days, back in the 90s, it just wasn't, you weren't able to do it. But now you can because of the digital age that we live in. And so these newspapers show us how he's advertising his businesses, how he's advertising his book, how he, and not only that, he's not only advertising, but I found reference to where he says that his book is available in the bookstores in New Haven, which is why I knew another level of search, of uh, research needed to be done. So there's so much more to this Grimes narrative than what we were able to bring out. So I, I felt the need to, to, to say that because um, William Grimes, like he said, if I had been given the opportunity, I would have done so much more with mm. my life. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, a couple, two more questions. One, how do you think, how do you think he met uh, Clarissa, does he say? Um, <laughs> he really doesn't say mm. in his book how they met. Um, but I would say that the African-American community was quite small and they utilized their resources. When William Grimes got to New Haven, he, his first job that he got was from a gentleman by the name of Abel Lanson and his brother, William Lanson. William Lanson was huge among the African Americans in New Haven. In fact, they just erected a statue of him about a year ago. He was a civil engineer, mm. never really got his due. He did a lot of things for the African American community. And I venture to say that he was an abolitionist, okay? And so William Grimes had to be put into the circle of that kind of network. The Caesar family knew the Lansons, that we know. So that is probably how they connected. I am speculating, but it would make sense that it would come about that way. And then um, the Caesars were uh, involved, are members of the Temple Street Church, which is now the Dixwell Congregational Church, now I think in its 300th year. Wow. The oldest congregational church in the nation. Wow. Yes. And so there's church records as well that, that show that particular family. Mm. Mm. So my last question, and I'll pass it off to my colleagues here. So after you know, learning so much about, about, about William and his story and his connection to your family, and he's your great, great, great grandfather, is that correct? Yes, my okay. third great maternal grandfather. Wow. Um, so knowing all this about him, let's say tomorrow or this evening, he arrives for dinner. Oh my God. <laughs> what do you say to him? What do you talk about? What do you ask him? I would ask him, how did you learn to read and write? Tell me that story. I would ask him even before that, what is your mother's name? I have an idea, but I haven't found that solidifying connection. I don't know that I ever will. I will hold on to the fact that I, I, I will, especially as more records are being digitized. Um, so those two questions, I wanna know 
his mother. I want to know how she became enslaved. Um, because if she, if he is three parts white, passes as a Negro, then she had to be of mixed race ancestry herself. What is that story? I want to know her story, too. So I'm sure I would ask him a whole lot of things, but those would be the two most important wow. questions to me. Is there anything you'd want him to know about you? Was there, could you repeat that? Yes. Is there anything you would like him to know about you? I think he knows all about me. I think he was the catalyst behind all this. I think he was the one at my back in the middle of the night getting me out of my sleep, taking me on this journey. Mm. So I believe he knows all about me. Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you. And this is uh, Robert Smalls. And this has been an amazing oral history. I just like to say thank you so much for this. This has been an absolute treat. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a um, network that was used. I need you to speak a little oh, louder, please. I, I apologize about that. You mentioned a network that was utilized between enslaved people and free people in Savannah, Georgia. Do you know any more about that network? Was it an ethnic network in a sense, like Gullah Geechee people using uh, Geechee language? Well, I will say this. Mm -hmm. When I say there was this network, I am speculating that there had to be this word of mouth. Mm. Because how is it that a man that William Grimes didn't know, but he worked on the Thornton, this unknown man worked on the Thornton plantation, but had heard of about William Grimes. So there had to be a word of mouth. That's, there's no other way they could. They couldn't write, you know, even if they were literate, you weren't going to write notes and pass them because there were consequences to that. So they had to verbally have this network. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Gullah Geechee people in Savannah. Yes, ma'am. And he was inundated with that. Mm -hmm. He talks about um, Gullah Jack, for instance, in his narrative. Yes, he does. But, it, it is in a derogatory way, but in a playful, kidful uh, way. Um, see, the Gullah Geechee had their own dialect, mm -hmm. their own language. Mm -hmm. their, it was a broken um, English dialect. And William Grimes said he loved to hear Gullah Jack talk because he found humor in that broken English, mm -hmm. all right? So I'm trying to, I'm getting to a larger point here, which is probably why William Grimes was sought out in Savannah. He had six different masters representing these families as coachmen or whatever, mm -hmm. because he was, he could speak the King's English. Mm -hmm. He looked a certain part. All right, where the Gullah Geechee did not, mm -hmm. although they have a very rich and thriving history and culture, mm -hmm. but this is just the white man's way of, how, how can I say it, mm -hmm. of representing himself and who he wanted representing him. Mm -hmm. So I found it, even though William Grimes was a character, and when I say that, he, he was combative, all right? I said he was rebellious. He often got into troubles or trouble that Sometimes I felt, well, if you hadn't done this, maybe that consequence wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But 
that's who he was, but he still looked a certain part. He was always getting into trouble. Part of me wants to believe, actually, that he actually did write that doc that note about the doctor being a quack. <laughs> because that's yeah. so, yeah, isn't that like, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, he's swerving down that he that he didn't. But yeah, part of me wanted yeah. him to be the one to read it to. But I, in yeah. that instance, I really don't think he did. Okay. But he could that's have. I want that's to fair. I want to believe him. <laughs> I want to believe him. Okay. Um, simply because I could corroborate other aspects of the, of the the narrative. But I will say, if he said it, I wouldn't be mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be mad at him because there were so many other things to get mad about uh, the narrative in terms of to be a slave. But anyway, um, so yes, the Gullah Geechee are very important in Savannah's rich history. They uh, are fighting to be heard to this day, fighting for their heritage, their history to be preserved. Mm -hmm. And William Grimes shows where he's learning from the Gullah Geechee mm -hmm. people as well. For instance, they cultivated rice. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, was not an easy crop to harvest, but Africans knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. and William Grimes learned from them how to do that. He even had his own patch of, of a rice crop and different crops because what they would do would take it into town and sell it. So he was always looking at ways to make money. So he learned from them how to do that mm -hmm. and so that he could, to, could make money. So I'm really fascinated about his time in Savannah among the Gullah Geechee people. In fact, I've met with a, um, an anthropologist, and uh, he was the one to give me some insight about the Gullah Geechee and William Grimes Association with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I could not understand why this circle he, he, of six men in Savannah, they would uh, either hire William Grimes out or they would outright purchase him. But I came to believe it had to do with his appearance. Mm. And his appearance was very important even to William Grimes. Because he, again, he used it to his advantage in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. That was also mentioning Gullah Jack. That I found that to be amazing. Yeah. Especially with the Mark Vesey and his rebellion up in Charleston, South Carolina. That's a whole line of history that I say we need to find a little more on and do a little more research in how widespread that network had to be. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. But my second question is more for you and your own experience. So what tips do you have for those who seek to re-engage with their family history? Okay. So I heard part of that. So remember, I'm, 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 I'm very hard of hearing. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I have a soft voice. Yes, you do. <laughs> but what do you, but what tips do you have for others who seek to re-engage with their family history? Absolutely. Yes. Um, the first thing you have to do or should do is capture the stories from the elders, the super seniors, because they're not going to be with you long. You never know when they leave this planet. And oftentimes when we're at social gatherings, family reunions or what have you, you find the older people sitting in the corner and nobody's even engaging with them. They are, like Alex said, the libraries. They keep the information. So you want to have the stories. You know, the, you guys are doing this oral history project. It is uh, incredible. It's going to be a research even after you all are not here. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important thing. The first thing. Um, and then you want to get into genealogy. 
you have to and you start with yourself and work backwards and when i say start with yourself i'm talking about your records your vital statistics your birth certificate your church records um you know i'm catholic i, I have my first holy communion records i have my baptismal records and those kinds of things those things are very important in families so documents are very important uh, you want to know as you get deeper into your story, you want to um, get in with a genealogy group. Whatever your ethnicity is, you want to join that group, but then you want to join an um, overall group as well. Um, you want to uh, collect you want to know the oral history from the ancestors, not the ancestors, from the, the, the elders. You want to start with yourself and collect records. And then after you have your records, you move on to your parents. So it's like starting at the bottom of the family tree and not at the top. Mm -hmm. And you want to thoroughly research each branch. Okay? You want to keep excellent records computers there's all kinds of software that you can get as well but you don't need to do all that right now the first steps talk to the answer to the pff. the first step is to speak with the elders and capture their stories um, because after you do that you want to do the research you want to go to the family history centers that was which i did which is the mormon temple now they have ancestry.com and a whole host of other resources it's not as complicated or hard to do as it used to be mm -hmm. so that's what you should do mm -hmm. and appoint yourself the family historian hold on to records i will tell you um when my mother-in-law became ill and had to and moved to um, north carolina to be with her youngest daughter my husband and i had to clean out her house mm -hmm. there were so many documents that I found that were so useful to the family that they didn't know what they were looking at. Mm -hmm. I found letters for employment. I found um, uh, records and pictures of, old, of family they did not document very well. And I kept that, mm -hmm. kept it for them because I knew what I was looking at. And today, the family can't thank me enough for holding on to what they didn't value at the time because they were on a mission to get their mom to a certain location. Whatever was left behind would just be left behind. So anybody else, if they had ha hired someone to close out this house, it, it's, it's how valuables get lost in families. You understand? You know, so you, I think you told me of the Civil War diary that a family didn't know that they, or they had it, but they didn't know about it. It was going to be discarded. That's what happens in families. So ask those questions, too, in your family as you are interviewing them. Is there a family Bible? Do we have any old records in our family? Who has them? You know? So that's how you get started in genealogy. Mm -hmm. And then you... you once you are on that road and you gather that information, then you share it. That's how you have, when you have your family reunions, I call it adding meat on the bones. I mean, a lot of people have their, uh, their genealogy written down, but they can't tell you one thing about these people. They've got names and dates. So you want to colorize these people. You want to bring them to life. You want to tell their story as much as you can. So how do you do that? You also want to know your uh, local history. 
Mm -hmm. Let's say you're doing um, Savannah, Georgia. You've got roots in Savannah, Georgia. Well, at the time your uh, ancestor lived, what was going on in Savannah, Georgia? What was the regional story, local regional story? Then you want to put it on a national level. And then, depending upon your family story, it might be a global. You know, you may have to go to another country or what have you. So anyway, every family needs a family historian. And if you don't have one, then appoint yourself. That's what I tell mm. people. That's yes, what I tell them. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I, when I get back in Jacksonville, I'm going to become the family historian. All right. Yes, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, thank you again. This is amazing. Um, the, I mean, the questions I have are mostly answered. The last thing that was remaining was I was just curious. One of the themes that I heard both in what you were saying, but I've always considered and thinking about just slave narratives generally is the theme of bearing witness, the courage it takes to bear witness and how that can be transmitted from the text to someone who's reading it now. So that making the kind of bringing the past to life. And if you had any interest in saying a few more words on that in terms of how William Grimes's text today can be kept alive in terms of being taught both in colleges and undergraduates and informally and so on. And thank you again. Appreciate yes, you. Yes, thank you. Um, today, let me, let me just say, when, when I began my research and I recovered this narrative, nobody was studying his narrative. And when I go back, and that was in the 90s, when I go back even earlier to see what people wrote about him, it was very, very negative. And some historians even took liberty. Oh, William Grimes is so complicated and so, so combative or whatever that his wife even left him. Mm. Well, that's not true. They're taking liberty and they're not doing the research. Mm. That family, even though his children left, some of his children left New Haven and came to, to the Bay Area, San Francisco, in search of gold, as William Grimes writes in his um, closing, concluding, conclusion of the second narrative, 1855, um, I have found, in the autograph book will show, they never severed ties. There was no sort of divorce from the family. They communicate, I've found ship records where they went back and forth. William Grimes never left New Haven. And there's a reason why William Grimes wouldn't have left. He was, by the time his narratives came out, he was an old fixture in the community. He, um, Everybody knew him. Mm. He was well respected and regarded in the community. When he died, 15 newspapers wrote about him or shared his, even in California, mm. okay? Because his family was out here and his daughters put out an obituary. So, so, so when you don't do the research, you come away with your own story and it's not necessarily accurate. So um, to, to answer your question, And I forgot the question. That's okay. In many ways, you did answer it. So. Oh, I did in a roundabout way. I hope so. I do that from time to time. Yeah, it was great. It was um, you know, bearing witness, and then. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Bearing witness and so forth. So yes. One thing about what's so important. William Grimes decided to speak up and speak out. Not many African Americans got the opportunity to do that. And my goodness, what would they tell us if they could have? So I like to think that he gives voice to them. His narrative gives voice to those who were never allowed to speak their truth. Um, 
I wanted to, to say this. We, talk, we talked about William Grimes and having different names in enslavement. Mm -hmm. So he was William, he was John, he was Theodore, and he was Stephen in his narrative. Okay? And William Grimes had 12, well, he had 18 children, but only 12 survived. It's mm. a lot of those mm. people's minds. If you weren't alert when I was talking, you are now <laughs> hearing that. But there were many families that mirrored his as well. So he had two daughters that lived, and they were the ones that really kept the stories alive. But all of his sons um, died relatively young and without um, children. But he names all of his sons after himself. There's a William, there's a Stephen, there's a Theodore, and there's a John. Those are his names enslaved. <laughs> <laughs> but he found a way to rename him his son, or to name his his sons after himself several times over. So I thought that was really interesting. But <laughs> I chuckled when I figured that one out. Yeah. But um, I also think it's important. To, oh, that's another thing when you were asking about family history and so forth. Mm -hmm. Put everything on a timeline, everything on a timeline. And then the stories will start to come alive. The people will come alive, not just the communities. But when you put every event on a timeline, everything that's happening in um, your uh, local community, and then you'll find when you start to do the research, when your church records and st it, well, when you put it all into the pot and then put it in a, on an outline, you, you will have a story. You will have a, 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 a wonderful story to tell. And a lot of people say to me, you know, um, you were really fortunate to have the Bible pages come to you. And I certainly was. That was indeed a blessing. But I would have put this all together without those Bible pages. I, it would have taken me longer to figure it out. Four years later, I would find William Grimes, OK? And his daughters. And then the genealogy would come together. But Aunt Catherine, with the Bible pages, gave me a, a blueprint, but even if I didn't have it, I wouldn't have been able to figure it out. It'd take me longer. I would have been able to figure out all of his children as well, looking through vital statistics and so forth. So th what I want people to understand is that it is great when you have those artifacts in your family, especially for African Americans, because we haven't been able to hold on to anything or have that. Um, we do have families that do have that, but I'm talking about how it extends to us as a whole. We, our numbers don't measure up to other ethnic groups and so forth. So um, it's great to have, um, but you don't necessarily have to have them to get through the research. So I, I, that I really need to impress upon people. So, uh, you know, thank you so much again. This has been amazing. And uh, as we close our interview, I kind of just want to ask about the lineage from William Grimes to yourself. So could you, I guess, call on the names of those who came before you from William Grimes to yourself? Can I, oh, can I call those names? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I got to think about it. So there's William Grimes, William and Clarissa Grimes, and their daughter, Cecilia Victoria. She um, had a daughter named Mary Angeline Williams. And Mary Angeline had a daughter named Hazel Cecilia Fuller. 
so that means that I'm going to start again because I want to do it right. Okay, so William and Clarissa Caesar had a daughter named Cecilia Victoria Grimes, and she married William H. Williams. So her... Um, I'm trying to do too much. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna simplify it. So, William and Clarissa Grimes had a daughter named Cecilia Victoria. Cecilia Victoria had a daughter named Mary Angeline. Mary Angeline had a daughter named Hazel Cecilia. Hazel Cecilia had a daughter named Janet. Harris. Janet Harris had a daughter named Regina Mason. Wow. That's amazing. It is amazing. I want to tell you a little bit about William Grimes' youngest daughter, surviving daughter, who from which I stem. She was born in New Haven, Connecticut. She was the one that decided that she was going to uproot and come to California. She and her husband, William H. Williams, arrived in California in 1852. Um, Cecilia, he, he was a carpenter. He had wonderful skills. He built homes, I'm told, in San Francisco and in Daly City. Um, he is in that era. I don't know if you've heard of the name Mary Ellen Pleasant, who um, Part raid, who uh, funded part of that raid on Harper's Ferry with John Brown. They're of that era. Uh, Cecilia Victoria became a tragedian in the San Francisco Bay Area. She was performing plays, Shakespeare, when the Civil War was raging in the South. She wrote political poetry in support of Charles Sumner to the Senate. She is in newspapers galore. Mm -hmm. That Aunt Catherine told me so much about her when I was a kid. Aunt Catherine didn't know those fine details, but she was a tragedian. That was an oral story that was kept in the family. At the time, they didn't know that was William Grimes' daughter. Mm -hmm. At the time, they didn't know that she was well lauded in, in the Bay Area, so, which is another broader story to all of this. And um, whenever I don't have the confidence to stand up in front of an audience, I think about who I descend from and realize that Cecilia channeled me because she spoke to audiences. So I realize the shoulders that I stand on. So you imagine this fifth grade girl thinking she didn't have a history worth trumpeting. When I got done with all this, I realized the crown that I wear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everyone needs to discover that crown that they wear. Wow, this is amazing. Um, anything else? Well, uh, Regina, I feel like we've taken at least two plus hours of your time oh, already. Wow. And um, if you don't mind, I mean, there may be questions. We might do a follow up on Zoom and there also might be um, aspects of your family history you may want to share with us too. Okay. And so we can be in conversation about that. Oh, that'll that. be fine. That will be okay. perfect. Because I, I know I'm going to say, I should have said this and I should have said that. So, Well, you everything you said was just of an incredible, like, analytical value. Just like, wow, this is... <laughs> But I realize now we could easily be here till 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. And you have a lot of things to attend to as well. So, you know, again, just to echo what Donovan was saying, just thank you so much for your time. I can't thank you all enough. You guys are thanking me. I need, I'm, I need to thank you, and I didn't even on film get to do that. But I, I thank you so much.